We're back in the workshop guys, and in the last video you saw us assemble an arsenal of original artifacts and artworks to help inform the design of our gauntlets in the 15th century Italian infantry harness we're trying to build. In this episode, we're going to actually delve into the magic of the process and unpack how we take those two dimensional images and then reproduce them here in real life in steel as a three dimensional object. Finally, we're getting into some steel, hell yeah. At the end of the last video, you saw us send away our reference material to get printed. Connor and I went on a little adventure and here they are in the workshop, ready for us to check out. Of all the originals and source material that we've collected for this project, we need to choose one specific piece to be the main reference for our build. In this case, we've chosen the SCH23, a gauntlet found in the Sherberg Castle collection to be our main reference as we start on this project. The reason we've chosen this particular piece is because it matches best with the criteria that we laid out in our last video. First up, date. This gauntlet is dated between 1450 and 1460. We can tell that by some of the construction elements like the central crease and the shape of the cuff. Stylistically, it works really well with the region that we're looking at since it's of Italian make and some of the flutes here suggest that it may be an export to that Flemish and Western European market. The piece matches the status of the harness that we're trying to make in terms of finish. Even some of these cusping features match really nicely with the cusping on our sallet, which is the cornerstone of our entire infantry harness build. While our reference piece is actually a right hand gauntlet, it can still help guide our eye as we're shaping our manifer. What I've done to help us guide our eye through the process is add these two extra examples of actual manifers. This one, a gauntlet from Rome dated about 1470, and this gauntlet here from the Friedrich the Victorious Harness, 1455 to 1460. With our main reference chosen, we now embark on a huge challenge. How is it that we can take these images and turn them into a gauntlet in real life straight from the pages of history? There are two main approaches to how we can solve this problem. The first is to build as much of the shape as we can into a pattern using paper. The second approach is to forge that shape in steel and then use the detail we create there to generate a pattern later on. Today, we'll be leaning into the second and more historical approach, starting with the left-hand gauntlet, also known as a manifa. Finally! when your glasses keep fucking up! What you see me using here is a broader take on a technique called hammer rolling. Because we'll be heating up and raising over the entire piece in the next step anyways, I'm spreading out my hammer blows and passes to get the steel into the shape of a tube as fast as possible. I like to call this hammer bending.
Now, as you guys can see, we're beginning to shape the very first piece of our gauntlets, but you might notice something interesting, and that is that this one piece of steel is different from the original source material that we've been referencing, where the hand and the cuff have two separate pieces. What's going on there? Well, in the Italian style, the left hand gauntlet is often made with the metacarpal and the cuff all integrated into one singular piece of steel. This singular rigid gauntlet is known as the manifa or main de fer, which is French for hand of iron. That's pretty badass. But this left hand gauntlet is what we're gonna be making first up in our series. Among the regional styles in Europe in the 15th century, the Italian style of armor is quite easily recognizable due to its asymmetry. Stylistically, Milanese armors like the Avant harness have asymmetrical pauldrons, reinforcers, elbows, and gauntlets. This is because in fighting, the left hand side of the body is far more often presented to the opponent and thus is far more likely to be struck in the midst of the battle. Due to the Italian style of combat, the Italian armors were optimized for heavy mounted cavalry when compared with English or German styles of armor. For the Italian knight, his armor acts as a shield, catching the blows of his enemy and allowing the right hand to strike a deadly blow in return. In armoring, there's a constant tension between mobility and protection. Since the left hand's primary role is not as a fighting or striking hand, less mobility is required. In fact, the left hand's primary role is to hold the reins. And in mounted combat and in jousting, the left hand passes on the tilt side of the joust, that is the side closest to the oncoming lance. Thus, mobility, less important, protection, far more important in this case, and thus the Italians optimized protection here over mobility for the left hand gauntlet. Man, armoring is hot work. I needed to catch a break out here, but you guys can actually help us out with all that hard work by supporting us over on Patreon. We have a page with a bunch of different materials behind the scenes, and, and those cars are really loud. We even think about putting the patterns for our gauntlet build up on the page. So check us out on Patreon, we'd be much appreciated. All right, we're just raising back from the metacarpal to the wrist, and something that's really interesting to uh, see in the raising process is that this big lump of material around the wrist in order for that to disappear and be nice and smooth in our finish It needs to compress on itself and by compressing that steel is going to get thicker around the wrist area Instead of thinner which would normally happen if you were just stretching that shape into the steel pretty cool Hey, so we need to keep it super hot and be incremental on how we work it So we don't get any cold shuts and get a nice smooth finish
Raising is the cornerstone or primary technique that we use to sculpt steel in medieval armoring. It allows us to take what is essentially a rigid and unformable medium and put complex and beautiful shape into that steel. Raising involves driving waves, known as passes across the piece of armour. Each wave creates a step and when chased out creates the depth and shape in the piece of armour we're trying to create. As we work from the outside towards the wrist, we are maintaining the thickness of the steel around the deepest part of our gauntlet. In fact, this is precisely why we work from the outside in, since if we were to work from the inside out, the opposite way, we would be thinning the material by stretching it around the wrist of the gauntlet. And this is the exact opposite of what we want in good medieval armour. In fact, this is why raising is the primary and preferred method of forming steel, both in history and today, since it enables us to both maintain thickness and in some cases control the thickness of steel while creating the shape in the piece that we're working on. Interestingly enough, the armourer can actually control the thickness of material simultaneously to moving the steel. By changing the angle of the hammer to the steel, the armourer can thin or thicken the piece in the direction of travel. Another key technique point to keep in mind here is that the depth of your piece depends entirely on the angle at which you hold it to the T-stake. To raise correctly and control movement of the steel, it's crucial that you don't vary that angle throughout the pass as this will vary the geometry, create irregularity, and sometimes even thin out the steel. Raising is an incredibly versatile process. Much like an artist has a paintbrush or the mason has a chisel, the raising hammer and the tea stake are the weapons of choice for the armourer. The hammer is like his paintbrush and essentially what we're doing is sculpting what we envision from an original source into the steel. Sometimes the process can get more complicated and for more complex pieces, sometimes a variety of different stakes have to be used. But Raising enables us to shape in any direction and in any degree of complexity that we require, which is what we see in the originals and in the pieces that we need to fit what is ultimately quite a complex organism in the human body.